Hey guys, this is John, and I'm back with another Student Spotlight. There was a really great response to the first Student Spotlight, which was Marco's Magnificent Move. I highly recommend you watch that if you haven't. So I decided to record another one here. And this is based on a game that was played on January 6th, so not that long ago, by my student Tim Shimke, who's up here in the upper left-hand corner. He's playing the black pieces in this game. And his opponent is Bob Frisbee. Um, pretty close in rating, these two. And this game was played in Rochester, Minnesota at the Rochester Chess Club. It was a game in 60 game with, I believe, a 15 second increment or delay. And we reached this position. It was black to move, so Tim's move. And Tim had been pretty much winning for much of this game. You can see he's up a pawn at the moment in a rook end game. And in addition to being up a pawn, he has a very active king. And white has a couple weak pawns too, these a3 and c3 pawns. Also h5 is very exposed. So at this point, a good move for Tim would have been the move rook d5 to go after this pawn. Uh, but there's a variety of ways he could try to play this position for a win. However, uh, he played the move rook d3. And now what I want you guys to evaluate is what happens if white plays the move rook takes f4 check in reply. So... I'll tell you straight away, this is White's only good move in the position, Rook takes f4. And I want you guys to calculate it and tell me how the game should proceed after that. Uh, and just to warn you, this one is definitely harder than the previous uh, student spotlight. It will require more variations. So if you want to pause your video right now and try to calculate the ramifications of Rook takes f4 check, please do that. Okay, so now we're gonna find out what happens if white plays this rook takes f4 check move. And to do that, I'm going to just reload the game here with some of my analysis. Uh, so rook d3, this is a very unfortunate move by Tim. And I know he was <laughs> really regretting this move after the game. Um, it allows this deflection move, rook takes f4. So white deflects black's king away from guarding the rook. And after king takes, which is forced, and then king takes d3, we have an interesting situation where the respective kings are closer to a different pawn mass. Uh, so black's king is closer to the kingside pawns, and it makes a lot of sense for him to go after the h5 pawn and then try to win the g6 pawn and promote one of his kingside pawns here. Whereas white is very close to the queenside pawns, and he wants to win, win black's b5 pawn, uh, possibly the a4 pawn, and promote one of his pawns as well, most likely the c pawn, since if he wins b5, the c pawn will be passed. Uh, now, after king g5, which is what was played in the game, and then king d4, the game ended up being drawn, and I'll show you how it went. King takes h5, king c5, king takes g6, king takes b5, and now we're off to the races with our respective pawns. h5, c4, h4, c5, h3, c6, h2, c7, h1, queen, c8 equals queen. And if you calculated this far, Good job. Give yourself a pat on the back because I think this is a principal line. Uh, you would have to calculate it from the beginning. And if you evaluated this position as better for black but not entirely clear, I think that's probably the correct eval. Uh, black has an extra pawn, but it will be very tough to win this position. Um, you know, I've said before on this channel that rook, uh, sorry, not rook end games, queen end games are very diff difficult to win because there's always the possibility of a perpetual looming over both sides heads and that's what we have here you know even though black's up a pawn the specter of a perpetual is constantly lingering so i think a uh, draw is a fair result from here and that is what eventually happened if i were black i would play queen e4 by the way in this position and centralize and protect the pawn so going back there was an interesting possibility that was uncovered in analysis and that was instead of after in the beginning here, rook takes f4 check, king takes f4, king takes d3, king g5. Now, instead of king d4, if white had actually chosen this move king e4, white could end up winning this position. And the point is that after king takes h5, white has this awesome move king f5. Really great move. Protects g6, forces black's hand. Black has to go forward with the king, so no more capturing of the g6 pawn. His only other legal move is b4, and of course that just helps white c takes b4. So after king h4, you guys can probably see what's going to happen now. White can play king e6, 
King g3, King f7, going after the g7 pawn. And a little bit of counting is enough to confirm that white is going to queen first. And importantly, white queens with check because the black king was forced onto the g-file way back when. So white queens with check, very important detail. And this is winning for white now because after, say, king f2, there are several things white could do. Uh, but just to illustrate a very simple line, let's say white just gets behind the h-pawn. Black goes here. White could try to check black's king around and eventually win that way. But it would be sufficient for white to do something like this. Just move their king back, allow black to queen, and white's king is extremely close to the pawns, and they're just going to get another queen and win. Uh, so I thought this was like an amazing turn of events that could have been possible. And it all depends on where white moves the king here. King d4 or king e4. King d4 looks very natural, and I'm willing to bet that... Uh, 99 out of 100 people who played this position in like a blitz game would play king d4. Maybe some people would play c4, but uh, you just think automatically like, okay, I got to come up and eliminate these pawns and get a pass pawn because black's about to do the same thing to me. But nope, about face, white goes to the other side of the board, king e4. I just find this idea very nice and then go after the g pawn. And once again, you can see the fact that the king had to go to the g file. That's what really kills black in this whole line because white gets to queen with check. If white wasn't able to queen with check, the position is most likely a draw. You know, let's say black's king is on f2 instead of g3 and white has just played g8 queen. Black can just go h1 queen. It's probably a draw. So really, really nice line. No other way for black to play it. I mean, if he doesn't play king g3 or king g4, he's going to be blocking his own pawn from promoting. So that's also bad. Um, I just looked at another line just for reference here. If black kind of like understands what white's going to go for, and as in the game after king takes d3, let's say black tries to play king e5, like not going for the h5 pawn. This also loses because white can play c4, attacking the pawn on b5. And after takes, takes, white is going to go over here and win the a pawn. This would be a draw if these pawns did not exist. Okay, so if, if those kingside pawns were not there, this would just be equal because black could go hide in the corner. Um, actually, if black can get their king to c8 in that position, that would be sufficient. Uh, but here, this is just a win because eventually white's going to get their king free. So for instance, if king c6 now here, white will just uh, use the a pawn as a sacrificial lamb and go over and win black's g pawn and win the game. Very common technique in pawn end games. So to sum up, after rook d3, the correct move is rook takes f4, as we already noted prior to starting this problem. And the correct evaluation is that white wins, no matter what, with best play. Uh, but in the game, it was drawn because after king g5, white chose king d4 instead of the much stronger move, king e4. By the way, endgames are great for practicing your calculation, especially pawn endgames. So I highly recommend taking advantage of your endgame resources at your disposal, whether they're books or videos or whatnot, and use them for calculation practice too, because endgames uh, don't have to just be about studying endgames. Uh, to play endgames well, you have to incorporate evaluation and concrete calculation too, so you can practice those skills. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this student spotlight, and I'll be back with more videos soon. Thanks for watching, guys.